full of open space and and birds yeah so where <laughs> where are you walking now in which city or countryside i'm in newbury um on the north side of newbury and in a very historic area actually mm. and uh what's very interesting is that i'm about to go i'm about to go by a church that dates to oh probably the 12th century mm. but before too long i'm going to be walking across the campus of the world headquarters of vodafone wow <laughs> except um you know there there's no one there right now <laughs> <laughs> so what time is it now uh well it's an hour earlier than uh, than it is for you okay so, so it's still sunny a bit yeah it's actually it's turned out although it was snowing this morning it, it, <laughs> it's warmed up awesome so i was thinking this like, is hmm? No, go ahead. Yes, uh, I was thinking that we can like have our talk uh, 30 minutes and then see if the audience wants to be part of this and like share with us their thoughts, reflection and so on. What do you think? Um, yeah, no, that's perfect. Yes. I'm I'm going to discuss the points that I I usually discuss. Yeah. Which, yeah. Which you know, which you know a little. So. Yes, uh, and now I'm also recording this, so we can publish it on Urbanistica podcast as well. Very good. Yes. Uh, what do you think? Should we? Would you like to? Should we start? Yeah. Yeah. Whenever you're ready. Yes, I'm ready, and I think uh, let's welcome everybody here. Thank you so much for joining. And this is our third clubhouse event, uh, Urbanistica clubhouse event, and today we have a great guest, uh, Chuck. You were part of uh, a great episode as well. Uh, good to have you again here. So thank you so much for joining. Oh, thank you, Mr. So uh, how are you doing today? I We talked uh, before that you're taking a walk and we hear the birds <laughs> singing around you. Yeah, and I suppose, it's, I suppose it's relevant, very relevant to the topic. Because, um, as you know, I, I'm originally an American, but I've lived in the United Kingdom for a few years and um you know this is the this is the first major gateway out of this third lockdown today and today is the day that all of the non-essential shops open and the gym is open and you can go get a haircut and you know it's things have been quite regimented in the united kingdom and in england in particular here and um, so we're returning to a bit of normalcy, and I am out watching uh, watching some uh, some after school football as I walk by a school. Nice. Um, but I was just as I was just telling you, I think this is to the point of what is character. Okay, what is character coming out of the app? Yeah. Back, the uh, the pandemic. Well, mm -hmm. I just walked by a 12th century church. Can can you have the mic? Uh, can you have the mic closer to you? So. Um, yes. How's yes, that? Can yes. you hear me any better? Yeah. Okay. Um, what I was going to say is I just, I just walked by a 12th century church, which mm. some people would say, oh, that's, that's character, isn't it? But now, after, uh, about three minutes later, I'm about to walk across a technology campus, the world headquarters of Vodafone. And so that shows you how uh, character changes over time, particularly in communities with a long history, and that both are valid. Mm. And so that people who think of, you know, I feel strongly that people who think of character as just fairy tale heritage are, are uh, or, or what would be called in the United States, historic preservation. Are, are really missing a lot of the richness that that stands behind stands behind our our, our places and uh, as you know i've gone on for 280 pages on this topic recently for mm. for for my new book so yeah, yeah. Chuck, Chuck, let, let, let us start with a short highlight about you uh, so the listeners yeah. can, can follow your story so tell, tell us about you okay well, I, uh, I guess what's always on my mind is this book that has recently been released called Sustaining 
a city's culture and character. But um, I, I'd say more in more depth. Um, I was once what's called a land use and environmental lawyer in the United States for many, many, many years. And then um, always, because I also have a degree in urban planning, I, I always taught law to planning students on, on the side. That led to about 10 or 11 years of writing articles about cities, which has grown into three books and which grew into the way you and I know each other, Mustafa, to my being a visiting scholar at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, mm. where you went, where you went to school, and yeah. um, and um, so I'm, you know, I'm a I'm a recovering lawyer who's part academic and um, um, part author, part photographer, and. Uh, Tend to, tend to concentrate on the types of issues that we opened up talking about. That's awesome and good to have you. So let's start. What do you mean by urban character? Can you just define it for yeah. us? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, and I'm sure the audience would agree that, as I, as I said a moment ago, urban character is not just a heritage building or an ancient, charming English church in a um, in a smaller town. Urban character is is really highly dependent upon context, and so when we talk about sustaining character, we're not just talking about architecture. We're talking about cultures. We're talking about the natural environment, which may make up a large part of a setting, and um, I think. Certainly, as everyone is saying, you know, coming out of the pandemic, we have a tremendous opportunity to think about these things and how is it that we will reinvent our places and there there's a wide range of dialogue about how we must reinvent them equitably. Mm. And so I want to be I want to have a very broad definition of character because I think that is what is contemporarily quite quite important. Um, now, there's always going to be a visual component to it, but, um, um, well, I'll stop there. I think that answers your question. <laughs> so, I, I can keep going. Yeah, but, but go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. so so how, how did we think the urban character? Let's talk uh, before the pandemic. And so uh, well, because, hmm? yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Because later we will talk about how do we need to rethink the urban okay. character. Well, my, I guess my surmise is that too many people used character in an architectural way. And that, of course, it includes many things. Character, what I was starting to say a moment ago is that you know, even architectural character isn't just architectural because obviously buildings reflect the people who build them. Mm. But I, I think maybe what I'm at war against is this sort of, you know, call it elitist, if you will, but this, this sense that, oh, you know, we must be authentic and we must be charming and we must create communities that... Um, that, that, you know, fulfill an image of what we want them to be. And I think that risks, as, as many people have, have, have written and said, when you begin to get into concepts like authentic character or authenticity, it risks gentrification. It risks a sense of the storybook that is perhaps oriented more towards tourists than it is towards people who who live there. And so I'll give an extreme example. Yeah. Um, that one could have a setting with a tremendous natural landscape history that is not readily discernible. It could have a tremendous history 
as you know, you name it. it may, there may have been a, a town there once that is no longer. Um, there may be family memories that only are preserved within families that are no longer present. Um, what I advocate for, and this will, I guess this goes into, I think probably your later questions, but thinking about places so holistically that character means um, a very um, three-dimensional view, if you will, of, of what a place is. So, you know, the extreme would be a place that looks like an empty, say an empty field, but it has a vast history maybe a you know 50 years ago 500 years ago 5000 years ago i think we need to take the time to understand that it may not be incorporated in any further change or development but but we need to understand where where a place has come from mm. and do you think the pandemic gave us the opportunity to to understand more about the places that we are interested in yeah well, yeah, I mean, you know, you know about, and probably people who are for the moment listening and maybe conversing later, they know about, you know about the, like the slow cities movement of the last 20 years, the idea that we, you know, from an economic development standpoint, we honor local traditions, local cultures, local foods, local um, crops local ways of life and we don't just immediately adopt a fast-paced um, way of being about the places we visit we immerse in them and that's what i think the pandemic has also allowed us inadvertently to do because we have been caught in our places usually uh, more than we are accustomed to and so there's so many people are saying it's been paused for reflection. And while it has certainly accelerated many trends that are, you know, like online goods and, uh, um, you know, perhaps increased walkability and, you know, many, many good and bad things. It's also an opportunity to reflect um, more calmly and more immersively ab about where, where we are where we've been sitting, um, avoiding each other, you know? <laughs> yeah. So t tell me, tell me about your experience, uh, how, uh, the pandemic allowed you to build a stronger relationship with the places because also you started the, uh, great uh, YouTube and Instagram. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I, like you, I've always been someone who has been very interested in engaging people and thinking and talking about cities. And I used to, because I'm so much older, because I'm so much older than you, not wiser, just older. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, when when I when I started, the the printing press was was just starting, and you know, um, when I started um, taking time away um, from being a lawyer and writing about cities, um, you know, it was 2009, and digital publications were still. Uh, you know they were they were mature but they were they were still launching in the sense that it became possible for professionals like me to write for a local newspaper or that kind of thing right and and so it was the blog then um and so i've always done this and so for many years i had a blog yeah and then you know and then i had and my, but my blogs were always very visual and um, in the context, to answer your question specifically, even though I'd written books before, I hadn't really done this. Um, this time, being caught with a delayed publication deadline, um, and you know, in the third lockdown here in uh, in in England, I started a a short video series. There, there are too many great podcasters out there already, such as yourself. <laughs> and, you. uh, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, um, I decided that I would do just short videos about the, the concepts in the book. And so what that led me to do is to, um, as you kindly noticed, to, to make 
videos that were anywhere between say two or three minutes mm -hmm. with just myself or uh, videos that also had interviews that were dropped into them about the varying uh, elements of culture and character and context and what they might all mean. And so I was able through the pandemic to really look at say um, in, in Newbury or when I go back to London, some, some settings that um, perhaps were very storybook and physically oriented towards that, that more historic sense of character that I spoke of earlier. But then I would immediately take the camera to something that showed that character in a place is just far, far more than um, the ruins of a castle or, mm. you know, uh, an a historic home or, or whatever. But tell me why it's important for you to share this with other people. I mean, it's first we, we talked about it's about you building a relationship, a stronger relationship with the places. But now yeah. you're taking it one step further that you want to share yeah. this relationship with other people and show well, them. Well, well, thank you for asking. I mean, even when I was a lawyer and advocating for and against development projects, I always felt that um, understanding of place was very important because it would provide a more successful basis for a legal position. Because so many people, when they go work on a project, you know, they never visit the site. Yeah. Um, that's not just lawyers. It can ironically even be planners, you know. That's true. And, uh, and, and so what I wanted, what I, I mean, even um, I used to talk to my, my lawyer um, colleagues about getting, you know, understanding a place and, and understanding the the principles behind a place. I th I think what I'm trying to do now is some of the same, but also I do believe that some of the, I think this is more of what you were getting at, some of the movements that are currently, um, are, are currently very popular within, you know, within the overall field of, of urban planning or the, you know, the area of urbanism, they, they, they tend to be, uh, movements that are um, like many populist movements, they mm. they tend to involve people who are very active and enthusiastic, which is great. Yeah. And they tend to involve um, principles, however, that that I believe are sometimes too uh, one size fits all. And so I guess what I'm trying to do is help people understand how important it is for them to immerse in their own environments before they make particular recommendations or decisions mm -hmm. and that is not easy to do because we always want to move quickly right you yeah. know well, a tactical urbanist technique to help establish say a crosswalk where the government is not pursuing a crosswalk or bike lanes is to go out and do it yourself right yeah um and that's that's okay i mean people get confused because they think i'm being uh, critical of that underlying concept. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm saying make sure that it's in the context of where you are. It may be that in a given setting, advocating um, a different way with governments or with through you know other decision makers is a better way to go. Um, don't you know? Be very careful about practices that are borrowed from elsewhere, mm. um, and make sure they they align with. Um, with where, where you are. And so that's why, if I may, I mean, the book has the, these two, the, the very flexible methods. You can, you can um, also um, very short tell uh, the audience about which book are you referring to? Oh, yeah, 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 the, the new book, I'm sorry. Um, Sustaining a City's Culture and Character. It's built around um, a method called LEARN. Look, engage, assess, review and negotiate mm. and this is not you know a rigid formulation aimed at generating data per se it's just sort of principles to practice by and if you really think through the flexible meaning of those words on a project you're going to really get to the bottom of what you need to learn you know no pun intended what you need to learn 
about where you are and where you're operating and who you should be dealing with and negotiating uh, solutions between parties and so on. But I also have um, something that I call, you know, and these are big words maybe, and I've already said that words are dangerous, but still, uh, I, I call them um, context keys, and they have to do with familiarity, congruity, and integrity. Okay, and can, you, can, you, can you share with us more what does these words mean? Exactly. So familiarity, if you're, you know, I'm saying that, let's, let's use a solution of um, um, a very simple solution, if, like, um, you know, an understanding a public square mm. and how it's working. Um, and public, you know, public space is so important today. And for all of the reasons that people discuss. What I'm saying is there may be qualities of the space that are familiar based on somewhere uh, we've been before. You know, X may, space X may remind you of space Y from your childhood, mm -hmm. right? So that's familiarity. Mm. Um, congruity it, we, is an analysis, a casual analysis of, well, um, is there really a relationship between this place from your childhood and where you are right now? Are, are the things you are assuming are going to happen here really valid? Or is that just a familiar memory that you're imposing on this? And then integrity means that you've really achieved the identity of the place itself, um, the, you know, the, the, the current place. And you're not just fabricating based on um, familiar experiences or fantasy or, or, or whatever. Now these, these, again, these are big words and I don't mean them to be controlling or um, exclusive. What I, I tend these, I, I want these to be guideposts for people to, to really immerse in a place and understand it. And I think, going back to your other question, I think the pandemic has allowed us a much more immersive opportunity to much more immersively understand a place. Um, if we want, if we want um, outdoor dining to remain and not just be a temporary um, post, you know, pandemic or po immediate post pandemic um, phenomena, in those places that don't have it. Uh, if we want the new bike lanes um, to remain, we have to think about the alignment between, um, you know, whether, whether they're going to work in a particular place versus another place. That can, and that draws in all these other factors like weather and the geographies and, you know, all sorts of things that that go back to the earlier part of the conversation about the true three-dimensional character of a place. Mm -hmm. So, 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 how does urban character mean after the pandemic? I mean, you talked uh, <laughs> pre and during and your experience. So, yeah. how do you think? Yeah, this should be after the pandemic. Well, I think when we talk about retaining or understanding urban character after the pandemic. Needless to say, I'm going to say, I mean, whether you use my magic big words or not, you know, it, it, should, it should be an immersive exercise. It should be highly contextual. Now, one of the leaders of the, the placemaking movement, um, Ethan Kent, yeah. I, think, I, I think he's irritated with me because <laughs> he said he's never known placemaking not to be contextual because it, it relies so much on what the local people want. And, you know, his father, Fred, always talked about the locals being the experts. And in order to get things right, you have to turn them upside down before they're right side up. Okay, I agree with that. But to advocate a placemaking solution without understanding whether it is going to fit in a different context than it's being imported from takes a little bit of work. And that's what I hope 
as we come out of the pandemic, we do. I think we have a, an opportunity to slow down a little bit and think a little bit more carefully. I don't see that much evidence that it's happening, by the way, mm -hmm. because I think there's a lot of people out to share messages, just like I am. Um, I think there, are, you know, I think there are consultants who are out to you know, earn money <laughs> as a result of the pandemic, quite honestly. And um, I see people moving very, very quickly with notions and solutions that sound a lot alike. Um, and that could be okay, mm -hmm. or it might not lead to long-term um, solutions. So to answer your question concisely, I would argue um, that post-pandemic, um, we should continue some of the careful in-place immersion that we've had the benefit of um, during the pandemic. You commented early on, Chuck, are you outside? I hear birds. Well, there's lots of talk out, out there about how people have rediscovered bird song during the pandemic, and that's a very good thing, right? So, um, so am I being clear? You don't have to agree with me. I just want to so, so you, you think, yeah. you think uh, there are so many solutions that fits to the short term, but not for the long, long term. And these solutions are mainly just to, to earn money. Uh, that's an extreme interpretation. <laughs> yes. Some, sometimes I do think that. Sometimes I do think that. Sometimes I don't because mm. Sometimes the short term solutions are the way to a demonstration project that can be absolutely brilliant. Um, but um, I think that, um, for instance, folks from, you know, in, in, in the new book, I talk about the experiences of the Gale firm in South America with the Villa 31 project. Can you have the mic a bit closer, please? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I talk about the experience of the the Gale, John Gale originally, uh, the Gale, Gale firm out of Copenhagen, and um, they of course do work around the world. Um, um, and they were working in South America on a project called Villa 31, mm. and their obligation, their task was to to take a newer part of the city of, of um, that that was not, uh, and that's the city was Buenos Aires, which is not well connected to the more modern city. Mm. And this often happens when cities are trying to integrate arrival cities or you know casual settlements on the periphery. Um, they found that a physical solution, a simple physical solution, was only part of the problem or part of the solution, you know, putting bridges over highways. Yeah, of course. Or, you know, creating walkable and those, th those could be pedestrian bridges or whatever. But also they had to learn a tremendous amount about what created a sense of community in the, uh, the, 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 the city, the disconnected, let's call it an arrival type city um, with all of its small spaces and its, you know, natural um, uh, inter human interrelationships and so on and so forth. I'm saying that they, they learned that to do a successful job, they really, really, really had to understand the patterns of, of both places and that bringing, importing ideas from elsewhere, um, some may apply, mm. but some some may not. Yes, yes, I understand. So, if if we want to rethink places now after the pandemic, what are the the elements that we should think about? Well, I think it's easy to say that maybe the pandemic taught us that we really want to be. You know the sidewalk dining is 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 a good thing, and that street street you know 
lives that flow into public living rooms, so to speak, are, are a good thing and that public spaces are good things and that automobiles should be discouraged or should be deprioritized. Um, that goes without saying. But I think there's many, many other aspects that we, you know, we can and should learn um, as a result of this time. And, it, and some of it is very, very simple. And that has to do with, you know, uh, I mentioned earlier, by way of example, bird song, you know, the importance of integrated natural spaces, because we've learned to see and listen and hear the city with fewer automobiles. Um, we also have learned more about the relationships between the natural and the built environment and to um, look, look hard at those relationships. I think we've learned through a tremendous sense of loss, the importance of uh, relationships and listening to one another. And um, one thing that I had already written a lot about is not just the listening that is the stuff of a public hearing on a project, mm. but that, you know, the variety of um, co-creation activities that have, can, and will take place in terms of helping plot a city's uh, future. So that, it, you know, I would just say that, that you know, again, the pandemic ex is accelerating things that were happening anyway, co-creation being one of them, yeah. but really honoring the expertise of people who actually live in a place, who understand the patterns of a place, who understand what might be done to avoid gentrifying a place and help with some internal reinvestment of both monetary and emotional capital. Um, so I, I, I think the pandemic has just given us pause to, to look, listen, and feel the world around us while not denying how it has accelerated many trends, some of them being quite positive from the standpoint of um, sustainability and, you know, and other things. Yeah. What, what are the other factors? Are there others? Other factors in and in, in, to, or in, other, other elements to to rethink the places after or reinvent the places. Uh, well, I think that I primarily so far I've 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 listed I've sort of endorsed ongoing reinvention of public spaces and transportation networks. I've endorsed um, the value of human capital listening. Uh, local expertise and co-creation. Um, I think it's time also to incorporate, you know, many, many, you know, the natural features or environment, the natural environment speaks and, and, and adopting natural environmental features, as we've heard about in Paris and many other cities, speaks also to climate change, doesn't it? Um, um, I think that there are also other aspects that fall within the areas I've listed already, because with rethinking transportation networks, this is where you get into bike lanes and, you know, more, more walkable places and so on and so forth. But um, I've probably exhausted the litany of urbanistic, <laughs> you know, um, um, the things that urbanists like to talk about. Mm. Um, but I want to stress that, that again, it, it, you know, there needs to be a more careful calibration than perhaps some people assume because all of these things are not going to work the same way everywhere. Exactly. But do you think, are we really going to reinvent 
places or we will just like you know after the pandemic we will say okay that's fine back to the normal and we yeah we do yeah. what we used to do and like really forget about what we learned um well history would suggest that uh maybe you're maybe you're on to something <laughs> you know because after a, after a couple of years people people may forget however i do think I'd, I'd, I'd take issue with your, um, I'm more of an optimist than that because I really think that what has happened is, um, whereas some of these things that were evolving anyway, um, let's just say, one thing I didn't mention was probably what's an inevitable um, tilt towards live work environments. Um, mixed use environments you know filling empty shops that can could no longer sustain themselves during the pandemic and aren't coming back and replacing them with some something new which might be um housing closer to work or internet showrooms in the front and shipping operations in the back or however the high street or main streets are being re-envisioned. Uh, to answer your point, I think one thing is certain, and that is that this pandemic accelerated a lot of trends that were already underway mm. by many years. And so I would say, well, even if it's more of the same, we've suddenly traveled five or 10 years in a year. Wow. Mm. Yeah. I agree with you because the thing why, why I am asking uh, now I've been doing podcasts for more than a year and I started almost in during the COVID, the pandemic. And, you know, I've, many people say, OK, we need to reflect, we need to pause, we need to stop our autopilot, we need to think. Uh, but I think that we, we are going to, to forget what we learned. And now I'm trying to get some advices about, okay, how can we be more serious about what we learn and actually consider it when we plan and design our cities? So do you have any advices that, okay, how can we just remember what we learned and really consider it? If I may, I'll just, so, so I'll answer the question. I know that at least one person has their hand up. I think um, what, I, what I was saying, Mustafa, is that, um, this new book I wrote before any of us knew the pandemic was going to happen in, in many ways. Most of the book was written beforehand, and then I, I went back and readjusted some things. But um, in the book, the idea was that, you know, I, I, I had a section which said, imagine that the world around you, as you know, it disappears. And all the paths that you're used to traveling and so on and so forth, just go away. How would you reinvent the city to your liking? You know, mm. if you were in Athens, if you're in Athens, you're not going back to ancient Greece. Mm. You know, what, <laughs> what, what, what would you do? And so that was the opportunity to go into this deep dive about how to understand a place, which I've only outlined so far today. Mm. And so I think to answer your question, it's not just we take time to pause. Um, there are methods, there are di methods of diligence to really, really understand a place before going forward. And, you know, some people will follow them, maybe some will not, but it, it is through the very questions you've asked about what is character, mm. what is authenticity? that you suddenly realize these words mean nothing unless you put them in context. And Chuck, can you give us like three takeaway messages to all the listeners? Sure, there's there's still a few listeners here, I see. And I think that um, they'll be similar to, to um, the longer podcasts that we did. I really urge everyone to, um, to invest the time in understanding their surroundings, whatever the scale of their surroundings might be, and to, um, upon receiving a message that sounds like a good idea, mm. um, think hard about whether it can and will work um, in your place. Um, 
Number two, um, I think um, something that I always have strongly believed in, as I said, is um, uh, undertaking a, a documentation exercise for your place, be it with, um, it's, it's very easy to do these days with say a journal or a written journal or Instagram or, you know, video. Um, all of these things are possible and you can think about what it is the physical environment actually represents other than itself. Um, and then um, thirdly, I think I'll, I'll go against myself and say that there are some things that require some immediate attention and, um, you know, maybe some demonstration projects and so on and so forth. And what should those be? Um, where, where can we perhaps affect change on a, on a more dramatic scale simply by um, doing small things by, by example, and perhaps in many cases they're what comes most naturally between people and where they live. Um, it may be shopping locally. It may be, it, it may be participating in some sort of neighborhood improvement project or a tactical project, but. Those are my three. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. And I'm really happy that we talked again. And yeah, thanks a lot for sharing your reflections and also some of the methods that we that helped us to, to reflect about uh, the places. So yeah, again, I'm happy to talk to you and hopefully uh, we will have more Clubhouse events in the future. Yeah, thanks so much for thinking of me again for this. Uh, and um, anyone who wishes can feel free to get in touch as well. Yes. Uh, by the way, can you just share with us your Instagram account, username? Uh, so? yeah, uh, yeah, my my Instagram and my Twitter are are um, at cr wolf law c r w o l f e l a w. Mm, awesome. And they are they are actually linked to your uh, clubhouse profile, so people can easy. Yeah, just yeah, I access. guess they are. Yeah, they are. Yeah, That's correct. Awesome. So thank you so much, and wish you a great evening for you and for all the listeners. Bye. Yeah, same to everyone else. Bye bye. Bye bye.